Good morning, everyone, and thanks for joining FreightWaves TV. I'm Matt Pyatt, co-founder and CEO of Arrival Logistics, and I'm joined with by Andrew Silver, CEO of Molo Solutions. We're here today to talk about the metrics that matter. We're going to talk about internal metrics that kind of drive our business, as well as talking about the metrics we look at externally to help us make educated decisions. Uh, a little background on Arrival Logistics. Uh, we're about six years old. We're headquartered in Austin, Texas. We've got an office in Chicago and Chattanooga, around 1,000 employees, and we're on pace to do around $700 million in revenue. Uh, Andrew, before we get started, will you give us a quick little overview of yourself as well as Molo? Absolutely, Matt. Great to see you again. Glad to be on here with you for the second time. Uh, hopefully our perspective can help some other folks in the industry make some, some quality choices for their own businesses. So Molo was founded on July 5th, 2017. We actually just came up on our... Uh, our third birthday, I guess. We finished our third year. Uh, we are based in Chicago, Illinois, and we'll be opening an office in Nashville in, in January 2021. We have 225 people a day. We, we did finish our third year at, at $175 million in revenue. Like Arrive, you know, we, we are a, a, a high growth, service obsessed freight brokerage, just a little higher growth and a little more service obsessed. All right, Andrew. Well, well, we'll talk about that a little bit throughout this presentation, I'm sure. But uh, can you kind of get started? I think what's really interesting is, you know, talking about as a CEO, you know, what are some of the metrics that you really, really cared about when you first started Molo? And then how has that transitioned from, you know, year one to year three where you are today? And, you know, what are some metrics that you're actually layering in that you probably didn't even think about caring about when you first started the company? Absolutely. So, you know, I, I think we should take it a step back and, and just look at kind of the position that you and I are in compared to what I think a lot of brokerages have when they first start. So, you know, when you're starting a company, especially a freight brokerage, you, it's imperative you know what you're trying to accomplish and, and really understand the resources you have at your disposal. So for guys like you and I, I mean, we're, we're ultra competitive and, and we wanted to take the world by storm, right? We wanted to be in the conversation with the companies like CH and, and Coyote and TQLs of the world and be able to compete with those guys. But but you can't do that until you really have uh, a, a strong network, right? And and it takes having scale to get to that point where you have those network effects that, that give you an advantage against smaller companies. So uh, for us, those first few years, it was all about growth. Where, where other companies might be nickel and diming to make sure that they're profiting on every single load and, and, and profit is just such a core important function of what you're doing, that, that that's different, right? So we, we were fortunate to have the resources we did where we can say, hey, we're gonna build a really strong network. And to do that, uh, you have to focus on growth. And, and, and for that, it's it's looking at your, your, on the customer side of the business, it's, it's how many companies am I talking to every day, every month, how many are we signing up? And then once we get that first load, how long is it taking us to get the second load and the 10th load and the 100th load and continue to grow? And, and similarly on the carrier side of the business, right, where it's, um, how many carriers are we reaching out to every day? How are we getting these contracts set up and then getting them hauling for us? Are we understanding their needs and then starting to merge them into, into the needs of our customers? And I think from day one, where it's all growth, you know, we're still growth obsessed today, but we're trying to be a little bit smarter and more strategic in terms of how we connect our carriers and our customers to get their networks to align. And, and so that to me is, is something that's worth talking about. What are your thoughts there? Yeah, I mean, absolutely. I think it's, you know, I think it's data overload today. Like everyone is so obsessed with data in this industry. Obviously, FreightWaves is out there doing an unbelievable job, you know, trying to give everyone as much information as humanly possible, whether you're a shipper or a carrier or a broker. You know, so I can definitely echo the statement that at the beginning for us, it was all about growth. Now, obviously, we cared about how much cash do we have in the bank? You know, were we able to pay payroll? Um, you know, all of those things are obviously really important for us. You know, as a, as, a, as a startup, we did not raise a whole lot of money, and it wasn't until about three years in where we brought in some, you know, sizable capital um, that kind of allowed us to operate in, in a similar mindset that you kind of just referenced, where it's like, hey, let's think about the bigger picture. Let's make sure that we're growing corridor growth. We're growing core carriers. We're growing core customers. Um, you know, we're focusing on the bigger picture rather than just day to day, um, you know, paying of the bills. You know, and then if you look at where we are now, you know, I think a lot of things change at that, you know, 250, 300 million dollar plus size where you're diving into coverage scorecards. You're looking at service metrics. You're looking at employee engagement. You're looking at, you know, award management. You're looking at your ratios of contractual freight versus spot freight. Um, you know, we're looking at 
hey, if we continue to grow at the rate that we're growing, you know, how do we basically forecast that growth accurately so that we can have the amount of carrier capacity in our network to be able to service that freight? Um, so I think, you know, at this point, everything to us is, is, is extremely data driven um, and, and, you know, love to talk a little bit about, about, you know, some of the ones that you talked about, core customers, growing your customers. But I think that all comes down to service, right? Like we, we can agree that, you know, some of the most important metrics and, you know, I can sit here and, you know, admit that at the beginning, you know, you're trying to service the best that you can, but you don't have a technology stack that can probably even tell us what our on-time delivery, on-time pickup was. You're so dependent on customers giving you that information. You know, now, now that we've built our own proprietary software, you know, all of that is automated internally. We know exactly what all of our service metrics are. Um, but yeah, I'd love to dive into service and, you know, how you guys look at service metrics and, you know, what you guys think are important. Yeah, absolutely. You know, it's, it's just funny. You think back to like the early days, you know, I, I hear stories from, you know, our president, Matt Vogrich, he talks about, you know, his first load that we ever booked, we actually had to chase quick pay a carrier to take it because nobody knows who the hell you are day one. And, and being able to develop that over time and develop a rapport and reputation in the industry as a reliable service provider is what, what gives you an advantage and it gives you the opportunity to start focusing more on, on the data, as you mentioned. And, you know, when you talk about data, everyone talks about data-driven decision-making and, and obviously that's incredibly important, but who's determining what data to look at? And, and, and for me, it all comes down to your customers, right? So. I try to focus as much of my time as I can on talking to our customers and understanding what is it they want from us? What are their needs today? What are their needs tomorrow and into the future? And how can we cater the service offering we have to support that, right? So customer scorecards is 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 maybe the most important thing that I'm looking at on a day-to-day -day basis. Kraft Heinz, great example, every Wednesday at noon, I get the same exact scorecard and it's the first thing I'm looking at in my inbox and understanding, okay, where do we where do we line up against our competition? And, and if there are any shippers watching this, I highly recommend you deploy a customer, or I'm sorry, a carrier scorecard for your carriers and brokers to benchmark against one another and understand how they're performing. You know, more recently, they've started to to deploy their own new technologies through resources like Forkites, and, and that has changed how we've had to uh, scorecard our internal people, right? So uh, as companies like Forkites get the interest of shippers, it's on us as the broker to to support that that endeavor and make sure that we're doing our part to, to live up to the expectations set for us by our customers. Is that, is that aligned yeah. with how you think about that? Yeah. I mean, we look at scorecarding internally and externally very different. Um, you know, obviously shippers are very, very concerned around on-time pickup, on-time delivery, uh, auto track percentage, you know, maybe they care, you know, some customers care about compliance of updates. So we have a, a little more robust internal scorecard that probably judges a little bit more metrics. You know, we look at roll percentages, we look at late balance percentages. Um, you know, we have a kind of our own internal, you know, metrics that drive an overall service score. And we started to build this out, you know, uh, last year or, or late last year, because we finally had the capability to do it. And, and we're up almost 50% in our blended service score because once again, it's, it's, it's crazy. Whether it's metrics that we look at or metrics that employees look at, when you start tying your employees and holding them accountable to metrics and show them what their metrics are and tie a carrot or a stick from a compensation perspective to it, it really drives the right results. So, um, you know, we're really fortunate that we're, we're at a place where we can really drive that home. Um, but yeah, we, we look at it on a carrier rep level. We look at it on a carrier level. Um, and that way, when we're working with, what, if it's an enterprise shipper that you know, demands you know, four kites or Project 44 or macro point type visibility, we know exactly what carriers we're compliant with. Um, and we're able to kind of drive that metric in the right direction. And you know, we've obviously, as everyone, it's, you know, these shippers are asking more and more and more of, of their providers. Um, so if you're not able to provide great visibility and great on-time pick and delivery, it's almost impossible to grow your contractual freight. Um, and, and I think we can both talk about contractual freight all day long, um, but that's that's a huge differentiator for both of our companies is, you know, a lot of companies, a lot of brokers, you know, they get stuck at that 50 million, 100 million, $200 million in size. Um, and, and a lot of that is one of a few reasons. Number one, they don't have the liquidity and working capital to invest into more growth or two, they're happy with the profitability that they're at, or three, they don't have the internal systems and processes to be able to move a contractual freight 
you know, effectively. You know, going out and building a hundred million dollar transactional business for both of us is, is was really, really, you know, pretty simple. But being able to take that pivot and become a world class contractual freight where you can go into the Fortune 1000 and take sizable contractual awards, it's difficult. So, like, how did you guys? Because I know you guys are, you know, a lot of heavy contractual obligations. Like. How have you guys been successful at driving contractual freight, servicing contractual freight? And then what tools and metrics are you looking externally um, to kind of guide you on what freight to take and what to quote? Yeah, Matt, I think those were a lot of great points. You know, at one point you mentioned balance percentage, and I think I'll try to define that for for people who may not be familiar with the the kind of terminology. For for us, a balance is is when a carrier bails on a shipment last minute or after it's been assigned to them. And, and that can be for any reason, whether it's uh, they found a more profitable order or uh, they simply had a truck breakdown. And, and it's really important that you're leveraging your carrier KPIs to ensure that that your your reps are doing their job to service your customers. You know, especially in a, in a, in a business like ours where we are so service focused, both of us, and we've grown as quickly as we have, We've done that with contractual volumes, and contractual volumes, you're you're exposed to some of the the volatility in the market in terms of price, whether it's caused by produce season or or um, holidays or what have you, and, and it's it's imperative as we've talked a number of times before about making sure that when you do bring on contractual business that you're sourcing carriers to manage that business for you consistently, you know, developing a routing guide of carriers who want to haul that for you every day. Um, but even so, you know, you can't predict exactly what's going to happen. And so it's important that you focus on those those key service metrics to make sure that that you're taking care of your customers through thick and thin. Yeah, I mean, that there's sense? a lot of reasons. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I think we can all uh, agree that there's been a lot of factors outside of just seasonality that have made a lot of volatility over our last three or four months. I mean, we've been exposed to crazy increase in volumes in, in March with, you know, consumer spending and consumer hoarding before COVID. And, um, you know, then obviously a, a significant lull in April and May, and then things tightening back up in June going into the July 4th holiday. Um, so we, we've definitely seen a lot of factors outside of just seasonality. Um, and we, obviously back in 2017, 2018 with the hurricanes. So, so many things, you know, can really throw a wrench in contractual freight. And if you're covering it transactionally, you're always going to suffer. So, you know, like you said, when we're looking at, you know, bringing in contractual volume, it's, you know, who who are our carriers that we have? How much capacity do they have to run this consistently? Are we able to set this up on a dedicated carrier? Those are the only way to really be, you know, successful long-term with contractual freight. Um, so, you know, obviously we've talked about contractual. How much contractual freight do you guys have? Like, is it a, what, what is your blend? And, and how have you guys kind of made those decisions to go down that kind of uh, ratio? Yeah, so it's 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 the highest it's ever been right now, and, and that's 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 because of our our attempt to grow this thing as quickly as we can. Right now, it's at about seventy percent. Uh, I'd love for it to be at about fifty five percent on the high end, uh, so you can manage more of that spot transactionally. But um, you know, if, if you want to grow quickly, you have to do it through contractual volumes. I mean, you know, it all comes back to developing a strong carrier network. And some of the mid-sized carriers that are really, really good, they don't want to work with a broker who's only going to give them loads one off that one day they have a lane that works for them and then they don't have it again for two months. They want to work with someone who actually has committed volumes that, that they know they can rely on during times of, of peaks and times of valleys because that, that's what a partnership really is, is being to have each other's backs through the good times and the bad. What about you guys? Yeah, I mean, we were heavily transactional when we first started. Obviously, we raised very, very little money to get to get a ride off the ground, and um, we were we weren't financed to the point where we could take the the exposure that contractual freight brings to the business. So, back in 2018, we made a very uh, you know very intentional shift to driving contractual freight. Going into 2018, we we're almost zero percent contractual. Uh, and then as of today, we've actually grown that to over 50%. So today we're 50 to 52% contractual, depending on the month. Um, like you said, you want to be at 55%. Our goal going into 2020 was to be 50-50. Um, and the way that we look at contractual freight is we look at, you know, there's there's really great data. And DAT's got great data around the, the average contractual price versus the average spot price and the deviation between those two numbers. So we really look at that chart of data. We look at, you know, kind of where we think the economy is going. We look at the capacity that's in the market and we kind of make an educated decision that says, hey, we think the next 12 months, 
barring an economic event or, you know, barring a, you know, a weather event that is highly disruptive, you know, what do we think the next 12 looks like, 12 months looks like? And then that drives the strategy of how much contractual freight. If we think it's going to be highly volatile, you know, we're not going to be as aggressive. We're going to take our primary commitments that we've probably got established carriers. We're going to go on aggressive on shorter mid-haul lanes so we have minimized our exposure to risk. And then we're going to try to be second or third on the routing guide on other lanes that are a little more volatile. You know, if we think the market's going to be wide open because, um, you know, the contractual prices are way above the spot prices and we don't think that's going to change, then we'll go more aggressive and try to drive that contracted percentage up to call it 60, 70 percent. But I think we can both agree that right now, no one knows where the next six months are going. Um, so right now, we're trying to kind of hold steady with that 50 percent. And, you know, like you said earlier, get consistent carriers on it so that, you know, if things get really volatile, we have them already established. So, um, you know, that's kind of how we're looking at it. Um, and, and honestly, things change overnight. So there's no right or wrong answer. You're trying to get as much data as you can to make the right decision um, for you guys. So with everything you know, we just alluded to around the market and how crazy it is, how are you dealing with your employees and, and you know, employee sentiment and you know, are they engaged, like working from home and, and all the external you know, things that we're dealing with in the United States? Like, how are your employees doing and how are you monitoring that? So you made some great points there. I want to just touch on one of them before I jump into the employee stuff. And I, and I think it's for us, especially given given where we're at as as organizations both arrive and molo, I think one of the advantages we have is is the networks we have developed on the carrier side. And you know, each of us has been in a room with a customer, and, and as you're going through a bid, and they say, "Hey, we don't want you to just blanket bid on everything." And 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 that's it's important that you actually have a strategy behind how you manage that. So for us, we we've been really fortunate to focus a lot of our efforts recently on private fleets and being able to, to develop those relationships where we can bid on behalf of them. As you said, nobody knows what the next six to 12 months looks like. I mean, it's anybody's guess. Is it a Nike swoosh? Is it a square root? Is it a V? Is it a W? Is it a Q? I don't know what the hell it is. All I'm saying is if you can't predict that, you have to be able to rely on on, on good capacity that you know is going to be there for you. If they give you a price, they're going to live by that price and stick to it. So so that's been important. I know we're both doing that, and I think that's why a lot of our shippers respect and appreciate what we do for them. Now, uh, to touch on the employee stuff, I mean, it's hard to have really good – employee engagement metrics. It really is. Uh, but but one thing that's important to me, especially as, as we've built this business so focused on people, I mean, I, I truly believe that our people are a customer of ours. And if we don't create the absolute best environment for them, they will go work for someone else. Our industry has 15,000 competitors. There are a lot of them that will offer my people a job, right? So it's imperative that we keep them engaged. I think every brokerage, every company in the world this past four months has dealt with engagement issues. You'd be crazy if you didn't. I mean, the mental toll that COVID and, and everything going on in our world has taken on everybody, it's a real thing and it's a real impact. You know, we, we've been through a trauma as, as a civilization. We've all been through a trauma and it's important that we stay in touch with our people. So one of the things we, we do pretty frequently is these surveys and the most important thing to me is looking at the response rate and trying to understand a lot of the times we're up in the 80% response rate. And that tells me that our people care, right? I mean, if your response rate to a survey is 30 to 40%, you're lost. I mean, you're done. I mean, at this point, your people don't even care to tell you what's wrong with your business, right? And, and so for me, if I see that dip at all below that 80% number, I'm spending my time personally setting up these executive roundtables where I sit down with three or four people from each department and just talk and just try to have a conversation with them, open conversation, say, hey, what are we doing well? Where are we struggling? What do we need to do more of? And let them drive some of the metrics that we're going to think about for how we continue to grow our business. What do you think about that? Yeah, I mean, we, we definitely at the beginning when we were a lot younger, we relied on, you know, Inc. Best Places to Work and, and the local chapters of Best Places to Work in Austin and Chicago. And, you know, we they did surveys and, um, you know, we did a couple of surveys a year around engagement, but that is something that has completely changed over the last six months. We went out and we, we got this software called Peacon. And if you haven't tried it, Andrew, you should definitely check it out. It's unbelievable. They look at how many employees you have, where you're at, what the demographic of your employee base is, and they put a lot of benchmarks out there. And they ask questions about you know 50 different t subjects. And it's every couple of weeks you can set the frequency yourself. And it can be one question, it can be six questions. So you kind of have to find the right rhythm because you don't want to inundate your people with questions every single day. 
Um, and, and we really look at that engagement score. And before COVID, we were at an 8.2, and we have come down to an 8.1. It doesn't seem like a huge drop, but that is something that you know we, we spend a lot of time with. And we've really, really put our foot on the gas when it comes to communication because you know at the beginning, I think that every single employee was trying to prove to us as a leadership that, hey, working from home is a viable long-term solution. Because if you look at freight brokerage, it hasn't been an industry where we've allowed people to work from home historically. It's been a very, you got to come into the office, it's long hours, like you can't be effective working remotely. Um, at least that was, you know, how it was in my previous company and then here at Arrive. And I think every single employee was like, yes, I'm going to prove to everyone here that we can crush it at home. And then April came around, and then May, and then June, and now here we are in July. Um, I think that that's that we've lost a little bit of steam with that. So what we've done is every single team has two meetings every single day, one at seven and one at the end of the day. We deliver really, really small, attainable wins for the day so that the employees feel like they're engaged with their managers. You know, they know what winning looks like every single day. It's not this ambiguity around, you know, what do I need to work on? Because when you're in the office, it's so easy for you to be interacting with your, your managers. And, you know, so we're hoping that, that that increased engagement, twice a day meetings, delivering small, tangible wins. It's like when you build a to-do list, the best thing I ever have is checking off the to-do list, right? You build 10 things you got to do. And when you scratch it off, you're like, man, that felt really good. So we're trying to get back to the basics and allow our employees to feel like they're winning, even though they're not together, because our highest scores are on peer relations. They're in the nines internally for us. So when you're really, really propped up on peer relations and having an environment that we've created that's a lot of fun, and losing that with the work from home has definitely been tough. So we're trying to you know, get back to doing that. And then, like you said, we're doing a lot of all hands, ask us anything. You can answer, we'll answer any question on the spot. Uh, and, and being willing to be open and honest with our employees. And, you know, that's that's what we're doing. And, you know, obviously we're, we're excited to get back in the office. But when we survey, it's like 10 percent of our employees want to get back in the office. So it's 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 interesting. We'll see. We'll see how that plays out through the end of the year. I, I, th I think you made some phenomenal points there. The, the communication is so important. You know, we went from we used to do company wide meetings once every three, three, four weeks. Um, as soon as COVID hit, once a week we're doing them, and, and I typically lead them, and it's either a motivational something or talking about what's going on in the market or telling a story about some of our customers and some of the wins. And then we've had other people come in and, and take an opportunity to step in themselves. You know, you talk about vulnerability, and it's so important for us as leaders to to allow ourselves to be vulnerable. I mean, a few weeks ago, I told all of our people that I started seeing a therapist, and I think that's perfectly acceptable. That's human. It's important for us to be able to feel like we have an outlet. And and I need my people to know that, listen, this this thing, this what's going on in our world today, it's taking a toll on everybody. And and we are working from home. We're in a business where culture is so important. And being able to sit next to the person on your left and right, bounce ideas off each other, high five, whatever, celebrate one another's wins, support each other when we're dealing with losses, whatever it may be, that is so important. And yet it's it's a lot harder to do that now. It really is. So I, you know, I, I commend you for the creativity and how you're thinking about ways to continue to support your people. And we're trying to do the same thing. So, you know, I think, I think that's, it, it's guys like us, our companies and, and the people we have who are awesome people that are so bought in. We want We understand we're in this together. We not, we might not be sitting next to one another, but we're in this together. And we know that if, if we want to keep going strong, we got to keep supporting each other with everything we have. Yeah, it's, and I can say as a leader, this is this is the first time for almost every one of us on a leadership team. There's not a, a book on how to manage through this. Um, so I got a question. You know, obviously we're seeing uh, unemployment go through the roof. You see, you have the guaranteed um, you know unemployment support by the government. Who knows if that's going to go past July? Um, but how are you guys looking at you know hiring? Um, how are you looking at? where the market's going over the next, you know, six to 12 months. And, you know, are you staffing up your carrier capacity because you think it's going to be tight? And how do you guys kind of make those decisions internally, um, you know, to, of when to hire more capacity or when to hire more customer facing or more operations employees? You know, how do you guys as, as a company of your size make those decisions? So, so we're fortunate that our growth has, has honestly been so explosive. We've had no choice but to continue to hire. Uh, like I said, you know, year one, we did 17 million. Year two, it was 80 million. And then year three, we just finished 175 million. Uh, 
and, and we are, as an executive team, talking to our customers, especially the larger ones, on a daily, weekly basis. And especially around this time, as we're looking at hiring, I mean, the last few months, hiring has changed for us, for sure. Uh, we went from doing classes to hiring onesie, twosie, two, three people at a time and getting them trained virtually. Uh, we did that for the first two to three months of this. And now we finally got back to having full training classes of 14, 15 people. And we're going to continue to do that for the next year, two years, as we continue to hopefully experience this explosive growth. And frankly, for me, a lot of that is driven by the conversations I have with our customers, right? They tell us they're doing, hey, they say, you guys are doing a great job. You're in our growth category, right? We're trying to whittle our brokers down from 15 to five and you are a top performer, so we're going to take you from the 1 to 2 million that you're doing this year to potentially 5 to 10 if you want it, right? If you're willing to give us the right rates to go and get it. And we're in that position. We want to keep growing. So, you know, every one of our conversations with customers, fortunately, has been like that, which is allowing us to keep our foot on the gas pedal, continue to hire people to build out our carrier capacity to support our customer operations and, and, and additional sellers as well. What about you guys? Yeah, I mean, I think back in March, there was so much uncertainty about where the world was going. You know, we did a lot of a lot of analysis on on the cash freight levels back in 2008, 2009, 2010 during the last recession. And if you if you look back at that number from peak to to, to trough, you were looking at almost a 30 percent decline in freight. So, you know, we were looking at, okay, how is this going to play out? What is, how is consumer spending and consumer confidence going to drive freight? Which we, we all know that consumer spending um, is highly correlated to the freight market, right? The purchasing of goods and products. So, you know, we obviously were, we, we really changed our growth trajectory. We thought we were going to end this year with, you know, 1,300 employees. We'll probably now end the year with closer to 1,000. Um, so we're, we've definitely taken a more conservative, we were going to hire 600 people this year, right? And, and given the economic, you know, situations that we're in and, you know, kind of the uncertainty of where the market's going, you know, we're hiring on a need basis. And the way that we look at that is we've kind of reforecasted our business on a loads per day. We look at everything on a loads per day basis, not on a revenue basis, because if you think about it, we're no different than a manufacturing plant. As a shipper places an order, it's a, an order that we have to fill. And the way that we fill that order is through our carrier capacity, right? Um, you know, so we look at how many carrier reps do we have? What is their average tenure? On average, how many loads per day can they service at a high level of service? And then we extrapolate that over the next 24 months, 24 months to have a really good idea of how much capacity do we have. Um, and, and some of the things with, we had some turnover in 2019 and there's some turnover in 2020. So we're really making sure that we have the right ratios of employees right now, um, but we're not going as crazy as, you know, we were looking to grow 70% this year coming into the year. And, you know, I think we're going to be really, really happy with about 35, 40 percent growth, which if you look at the industry, that's still, you know, super competitive. But, you know, where we're at right now is we're making sure that we have the right operation support. We're having the right capacity. We're kind of like figuring out where things go and we'll put our foot back on the gas as, as soon as we have more clarity on where the market's heading. The holiday and June and produce and all those things have kind of covered up a lot of things. So we're excited to learn more. And then as soon as things get back to normal, we're looking to throw some more gas on the fire so we can continue to outgrow Molo. Um, Andrew? Well, I loved the answer until the end there. So, uh, <laughs> you know, listen, man, it, it, it's been great chatting with you. It's been great beating your numbers every year. Uh, I look forward to doing it again year four for us, but you guys have built a phenomenal business and, and it's, it's, it's fun to compete with you guys. So um, be great hanging out and talking. I look forward to seeing you again soon. We're out of time. So uh, sending it back to you, Emily. <laughs>